Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us during the Lithum Partners Investor Select Conference. My name is Adam Lowensteiner, Vice President of Lithum Partners. Our next presentation comes from GSE Systems, ticker symbol of GVP, that is Golf Victor Peter on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. Presenting from the company today is Mr. Kyle Loudermilk, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Emmett Pepe, Chief Financial Officer, both of GSE Systems. Before we begin, for those not familiar, Lithum Partners is one of the country's leading investor relations firms with more than two decades of corporate access experience. We have built one of the industry's most diverse and effective platforms for connecting small cap companies with high quality and focused institutional investors while creating a framework of best practices in all aspects of investor relations. Today's discussion hopefully is yet another example where we can bring value to multiple constituents. We will dive into the presentation in a moment, but one final item I want to remind everyone that GSE is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings. If you have not already signed up, please send me an email at lowensteiner at lithumpartners.com or visit www.lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual and click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. With that said, let me now turn the presentation over to Mr. Kyle Loudermilk, President and Chief Executive Officer of GSE. Kyle, please proceed. All right. Thanks, Adam, and thanks for having us. Uh, as Adam mentioned, I'm Kyle Loudermilk. I'm the CEO of GSC Solutions. Uh, Emmett Pepe is our CFO, and we're delighted to be here. So GSC Solutions, we are the future of power operations. I'll allow you all to read this slide. Uh, this is the standard forward-looking statements and non-GAAP financial measures description. So GSC, our mission, we are here to deliver advanced engineering services, technology, solutions and flexible workforce solutions, primarily to the nuclear power industry to support stable grid, energy security, and the decarbonization of the power sector. We have a long history going back over 50 years uh, where we built our first ever nuclear power plant simulator in 1970. Uh, Three companies merged in 1993 to form uh, the backbone of GSE simulation solutions business. And in 1995, we went public. We're proven with over five decades of experience, 1,100 installations and hundreds of customers in 50 countries across the globe. Since 2010, we've really focused on growing through acquisition and diversifying the business. Someone and I joined in 2015 and really accelerated, uh, came in on the heels of a, uh, acquisition called HyperSpring and accelerated our journey to diversify uh, the solutions that we offer specifically for the nuclear power industry, uh, aligning ourselves to essential services uh, that the industry needs to operate efficiently, effectively, and for the long term. And, effect, and we've relabeled and relaunched the company and our branding of our uh, capabilities in 2020. Who are we at a glance? We're one of the few publicly held independent companies that serves the clean energy sector of nuclear power and adjacencies. We deliver unique and essential engineering and workforce solutions, services and technology geared towards those industries. Uh, they include performance optimization, regulatory compliance, simulation training and staffing. And as a result, we really support the future of clean energy production and the deep decarbonization of the power industry. In the right-hand column here are uh, recent metrics regarding our company. I'll allow you to read through those. Our leadership team, a uh, bit about myself. I have over 20 years as an executive, really focused on uh, public and private company, technology companies, uh, growing them, transacting them in the, in the process. Uh, strong track record of revitalizing technology companies. Delighted to have the opportunity to come to GSE in 2015 and really affect a turnaround of the business and focus on diversification. I'm an engineer by education and grew up to be a business person. Emmett, maybe you can introduce yourself. Yes, hello everybody. Emmett Pepe, um, I'm a CFO of GSE. Uh, I'm a CPA, uh, I have a number of years experience in the software industry, telecommunications, I worked at MicroStrategy. That's where Kyle and I have crossed paths. Um, took a company public in Broadsoft back in uh, 2010. Um, and I've been at GSE uh, since 2016. All right. Thanks, Emmett. Don Horn heads up our engineering group. Deep, deep background in uh, engineering leadership. Has a great team uh, that works for Don. 
uh, really has a long-term vision for the business and delighted to uh, have come across Don through our acquisition of his company five years ago called True North. Brahme Sami is our chief technology officer. Uh, all things regarding simulation, R&D, uh, and the advancement of our technology solutions, Brahma and his team own that, working across the engineering force of our company. Uh, this is my third tour of duty with Brahma. We first worked with each other when Aspen Tech acquired the business he was at here in the DC area. And uh, uh, when I was at Datatel, uh, I was fortunate to have Brahma join us there, help us introduce new products, grow the business, and we sold it. And likewise, very fortunate to have Brahma uh, join, join us here uh, really from the onset in 2015. And Brian Green heads up our Workforce Solutions Group. Uh, Brian is really has a great track record uh, serving the nuclear power industry uh, as a professional uh, uh, executive leading uh, staffing groups, uh, first with System One, and again, uh, coming out of the uh, South and focusing um, on the nuclear power sector. So what's our strategic growth vision? We were an $85 million business prior to the pandemic and the pandemic really uh, uh, affected our clients and therefore affected our business. But through the diversification um, and deconcentration efforts that we led prior to the pandemic through acquisition, that really helped us uh, survive through the downturn in our business uh, during the course of the uh, pandemic. And we did that by focusing on essential services that the nuclear power industry in particular needs to operate safely, produce more power, and produce for the long term through lifetime extension efforts. So our current focus over the next two years is really to get back to the mid-60s from our current basis of the low 50s. And that is uh, through optimizing our operations. We took advantage of the pandemic to ensure we are as lean as possible, shedding costs, and we'll talk about that later. Um, as well as ensuring that we are engaging with customers and putting commercial infrastructure in place, such as master services agreements, so that all a customer needs to do is issue a PO to do business with us. These are non-trivial things that took a lot of time and effort, and we took advantage of that time during the pandemic. So our focus is to grow organically into the install base to get back to a point where we're cash flow break even. And that's really the entire company is focused on that. Um, Beyond that, we uh, would like to get back to pre-pandemic levels. So first step, get the cash flow break even. Next step, get back to pre-pandemic levels where we've shown and demonstrated that we throw off really good cash uh, at, that, at that point. And once we get there, then there's more optionality ahead of us. We can, uh, through a combination of organic and inorganic growth, uh, uh, grow to 200 million. But I will state that all along the way, we are a publicly held company and we'll um, uh, always entertain uh, strategic alternatives if something that makes sense for investors were to unfold. So, um, you know, we're excited about our growth vision. The entire team is incentivized and focused on that. So how are we gonna grow? Uh, in the next two years, focusing on optimizing operations for our clients, supporting lifetime extensions to 80 year operating licenses for the fleet, a lot of our engineering solutions and capabilities are required uh, by the nuclear operating fleet to um, affect that, their own strategies. We wanna cross sell newer GSE services into our current customer base. There's really not a nuclear utility out there that we haven't um, engaged with and, and have had a commercial relationship with, but we need to walk up the ladder into the budget holders and executive suites to cross sell GSE across the entire spectrum of our company into the entire spectrum of these client utilities. Uh, we're making great progress with uh, extending more services to support New Scale. New Scale went public through a SPAC. Uh, they're they're uh, making great progress towards building their first plants in Romania and the United States. We are very proud to be partnered with them as their uh, simulation uh, provider of choice, as well as uh, having more opportunities to serve new scale the closer they get to building their plants. And we have to focus on helping industry adjust challenges that they have, such as aging workforce and talent scarcity. We're a great solution for the industry. Beyond that, accelerating organic growth through introducing new technology products, um, focusing on simulation plant data and optimization expertise. We've had a number of press releases that shows this a very promising area for the industry and for us as a result. Uh, 
Japan prior to Fukushima was a very significant part of our business. Japan is now starting to actively engage in starting up more reactors and planning their next generation of reactors for national security, as well as for environmental reasons. And we recently traveled to Japan to, uh, uh, in partnership with the U.S. Embassy there and Japanese customers uh, to re-engage and, and make sure we're in pole position as that industry comes back. And we've also expanded partners to advanced reactors and SMRs. And then beyond that, and on top of the organic growth would be introduction of inorganic expansion as we have in the past. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for growth once we get to that point. And um, we outline a couple of those bullet points here. So we've had a number of really great recent wins uh, with the US Navy, a five-year contract that has been extended and expanded uh, over the course of those five years, just for the one contract for uh, 28, uh, over $28 million. Great win for the company, uh, honored to serve the mission of the US Navy. We were awarded over $3 million for engineering workforce solutions to help clients meet decarbonization goals. We've developed a first of its kind hydrogen plant model for new, new scale power. I've recently had a press release about that. Optimoder, op, operator optimizes plant with GSC solutions with our new thermal system monitoring enterprise platform upgrades. We've had a number of press releases around this new solution that's really gaining traction in the US fleet. Uh, we've extended uh, workforce solutions uh, by cross-selling uh, into significant clients uh, worth north, north of $3 million. Again, another press release there. Um, we have introduced a new solution that we branded to help nuclear power plants extend their lifetimes, um, and that's also very exciting. And we announced uh, that we have won a significant digital twin simulator for North Korea uh, excuse me, for a nuclear plant in South Korea uh, growing organically. And this demonstrates that we can grow organically internationally. So a roadmap to our growth goals. Again, um, for those that like to do technical and financial modeling of our business, uh, we need, we're really focused over the next years to get back to break even. And that shows what that looks like for the company at 66 million. At 80 million, this is a rough model of how much cash we throw off and it gets quite significant from there. And then as we look out to 2026 and beyond through organic plus inorganic, um, uh, we wanna get back on track. Thanks, Kyle. Um, let's go over the business. Give you guys a flavor for uh, GSC today. Um, we have uh, two, two primary segments, uh, GSC engineering, uh, and GSC workforce uh, solutions. On the engineering side, it's our design, simulation, and performance sector. Um, we have um, the you know simulators that enhance and design performance, engineering design and implementation, and then optimizing plant performance uh, and program applications. Workforce solutions is flexible staffing, training, specialized in nuclear programs, and um, it enables cus uh, our customers to continue to run smoothly, particularly when they have a, a talent shortage. Um, a little more depth on, on that, um, our you know, services, products, and people. Um, you know, th this slide, and you guys can read through it's a lot of detail, but it does highlight the various areas of our uh, expertise um, and bandwidth that we have, uh, ranging from engineering services, map modifications, consulting, staff, and training, thermal performance, and so forth. Market opportunities. So significant market opportunities, um, you know, 93 nuclear power plants. You got LNG, that is uh, a big opportunity for us. Um, you know, we have over 2 billion per year between engineering and staffing, uh, uh, basically 20 million per facility, and another uh, billion on the LNG side. So. Uh, a lot of opportunities out there for us to uh, to address. Uh, blue chip customers, you know, blue chip customers also is blue chip opportunities for us. Um, you know, in our uh, previous slides, our services, products, and people are really what these customers are looking for, and that's why they're using GSE. Uh, our business and. Um, you know, kind of help you all know, see uh, how we make money, how you would model it. 
Uh, two primary segments, engineering service and workshop solutions, currently about 60-40. Uh, the software piece of our business is part of the engineering services piece. Uh, on the workforce solutions, it's, you know, it's um, lower margin, um, but, you know, high volume. Um, time and material based, people have a need for white collar technical uh, staff. They come to us, we provide it, um, and it's, uh, you know, bill and collect based on the hours work. On the engineering services, uh, you know, some different projects, a lot of it are fixed price and uh, percentage of completion contracts. Higher margin, 30, 40% plus. And uh, a lot of those will recognize revenue uh, on a percentage complete basis. We do have some time and material contracts in there. Um, a lot of that from a cash flow perspective also falls into some of the milestone billing. So we'll, we'll do a lot of work. And then until we hit the milestone, we're not able to bill and bill and collect that, that re uh, revenue and cash. Um, software, which is embedded into engineering service as a reportable segment. Um, is about 10% of our business. Uh, as you'll see in a couple of slides future, we cracked through the 5 million mark on a trailing 12 months. Uh, that's been a, a growing for us. We focused on it. Um, high margins, 80, 90%. Uh, significant portion of our software is uh, SaaS or recurring maintenance subscription. Uh, there is a piece that's perpetual uh, that is still, still in place, but our focus is to have our customers uh, go to a SaaS model. Cross-selling our solutions. Uh, this is really what's gonna drive the, the, the next 18 months and, and, and even beyond of our organic growth. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of success as Kyle mentioned with um, um, integrating, uh, uh, we have GSA agreements and we have MSAs in place. We've got a deal that we announced with Next, Next Air Energy. Uh, both engineering services, workforce solutions, uh, three million order. So that that cross selling, uh, building upon both segments' capabilities is 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 going to give us the buoyancy and the way forward. Our software, you know, our, uh, our software solutions. We have four main areas. We have our dynamic simulation modeling software that uh, is uh, part of our simulation. Uh, and simulators that we would provide. Web-based training and vision is our product that's uh, in high demand, uh, particularly with a lot of people more working remotely, not going into the offices. You have access to the web, you have access to the training. Uh, thermal system monitoring software is, is the, the, the future. We're highly confident uh, on that model that it customers reap the benefit of saving money and improving their plant performance. And then we have software for engineering programs. Those four types of software are really what's driving our growth. And you can see on the recurring revenue only, the, the SaaS and, and maintenance renewals on a trailing 12 months, quarter to quarter, up uh, 47% from three and a half million to 5.2. Overall software, uh, on the trailing 12 months is up from 3.7 million to 5.9 million. Uh, we're focused on it, significant growth, and we're gonna stay focused on growing software. I'll pass it back to you, Kyle, for the nuclear industry. All right, thank you, Emmett. So yeah, let's talk about where the nuclear power industry um, is headed uh, from our perspective. So <clears throat> nuclear power is widely recognized today as an absolutely critical part of the world's power mix. Uh, that's changed a lot over the last six years, seven years we've been here, where nuclear was fighting for recognition, uh, for strategic environmental and national security, energy security. Uh, uh, and now it's widely accepted. We see it in the headlines regularly. Nuclear power is here to stay, and it's essential uh, across a variety of dimensions. So it's about 20% of the US power supply and provides more than half of carbon-free electricity uh, since 2020. So energy security and the headlines that we see today regarding energy security, particularly in Western Europe and in other areas of potential conflict in the globe, uh, nuclear power is domestic, it's sustainable, uh, and it produces clean energy. And uh, that also helps the world uh, prepare to achieve its decarbonization goals. 
Without nuclear, we simply can't achieve our net zero goals. The world needs nuclear power, and that's widely recognized today. So nuclear is going to be here for the long term. Uh, the U.S. makes up about 30% uh, of the world's nuclear energy uh, production. Our experts have experience working with these utilities and several more around the world. And we have a very deep understanding of regulations and emerging approaches uh, to serve nuclear power. In the United States, the average nuclear power plant lifetime spans 60 years. The existing fleet requires 20 to 40 years, possibly 80 year lifetime extensions. Uh, we're already seeing, uh, uh, when we first came in, there was a wave of 60 year lifetime extensions. Uh, we're currently in the midst of an 80 year lifetime extension wave that's moving through the fleet. Utilities are uh, approaching the NRC, applying for uh, lifetime extensions of another 20 years from 60 to 80. And there's already discussion of the first 100 year license, operating license uh, uh, for the next era plant uh, down in Turkey Point. So these plants are continually invested in so that they're safe. Uh, they have the highest efficiency equipment in them. And that investment allows these plants to produce more power incrementally over time with each wave of investment. Our company is purposely built through acquisition to serve these missions for the nuclear power fleet. So there's been a uh, significant support over the past few years uh, for clean energy, specifically nuclear. So with legislative initiatives such as the IRA, uh, creating a uh, carbon-free power sector by 2035, that's where you hear a carbon-free grid by 2035 with the US on a path to a net zero economy by 2050. Uh, this administration has reestablished a council of advisors on science and technology with the dedication to create more jobs and skilled trades to support clean energy sector, which includes nuclear. Uh, we need to increase the resilience of these facilities, uh, harden them and harden the grid so that it can handle variable uh, power production from wind and solar supported by the baseload of nuclear power. There's clearly a goal to phase out fossil fuel subsidies and um, uh, the US uh, infrastructure bill uh, in the tail end of 2021 also was had uh, key dimension supporting nuclear power. So that included a civil nuclear credit program for production of power from the federal level. We saw the states move this direction with New York, Illinois uh, and others uh, in, the, in, in the Midwest and Northeast. Uh, that has uh, ascended to the federal level to create more of a playing field with subsidies with wind and solar. It prefer, uh, by keeping the nuclear uh, power fleet in the United States operating, effective, and profitable, it preserves an immense amount of carbon-free electricity and provides tremendous security for our grid. We have funding through 2026 for the DOE uh, Department of Energy to implement the Advanced Reactor Development Program. These are going to be the reactors that are inherently safe, molten salt reactors, pebble bed reactors that are currently under development and investigation that will be running uh, many years in the future for the long term. Uh, the funding for uh, the Advanced Reactor Development Program demonstration project authorizes $3.2 billion through 2027, and we see some progress with uh, some of the advanced reactor uh, companies, uh, particularly here in Maryland, very exciting to see. With two, two, another $2.4 billion in awards uh, uh, to be awarded 2022 to 2025. So a lot of money, a lot of focus, both sustaining and supporting the existing nuclear power fleet, as well as preparing for the next generation of reactors. So What's, what's on the horizon? The immediate horizon is uh, the small modular reactor technology that really new scale is at the forefront of, and that is creating plants with small modular reactors that are walk away safe, uh, and they are built in a factory, delivered to the site, and erected on site versus built on site, which is what the traditional reactors uh, in the United States have been. Very expensive, very complicated, very one-off, one to the next. And this standardizes production, puts it in a factory for repetitiveness and quality control, very exciting uh, uh, means by which to produce these inherently safe reactors. And we see uh, the goal is to have the first module in place in Idaho for the UAPS utility by 2029 for NeScale, and uh, as well as a full-scale plant in Romania that is being supported by Romanian government and DOE to accelerate that program. With the instability in Eastern Europe, uh, 
historical reliance upon imported power, there's a big shift to um, uh, create this domestic baseload on the Eastern European uh, frontier states. Uh, and NewScale is uh, one, of the, one of the companies leading the way. So we're excited to be partnered with NewScale, but we also see G Itachi and a Rolls-Royce uh, consortium moving fast as well. Every SMR will need simulation technology. NewScale is standardized on ours, and we've been a client of theirs for over 10 years. So there's long lead times here, and the closer we get to seeing a plant built, that means the rest of GSE's capabilities can be uh, sold into this uh, sector. So very exciting, and this will be the next wave of new reactors that the world will see. And that means we're positioned for a bright future. You know, a uh, bit more specifically about NewScale, this picture here is our technology as implemented by NewScale as uh, their operator control island for operating up to 12 modules in a single plant. So they've developed a transformational technology that delivers scalable, safe, walkaway safe, reliable carbon-free power. 2012, they became we became their customer where they leveraged our technology uh, as part of the design certification application process. And they achieved that uh, certification from NRC, have been very public about their use of our technology and our partnership to achieve that in record time. We collaborate uh, with NewScale to create these energy exploration centers for research, which are really standing up these types of nuclear simulation islands in locations that are adjacent to where they plan to build plants, to train engineers, to prepare front-end engineering and design and the rest. Uh, New Scale went public through a SPAC, it's a small world, uh, you, you know, very exciting to see. And they're expected to have their first operational SMR, as I said, um, you know, 2027 breakground, 2029 to have something up and running. Thanks. Um, let's go through some, some financial highlights. Uh, as you can see, uh, obviously orders is uh, is key to, to future revenue and cash flow. Um, we definitely had a, a decline in orders in the front half of the year. Uh, bounce back some in Q Q3 of 22 uh, from the 6.8 to the 10.2 um, with the performance engineering uh, segment really being the strongest of that at 7.2. Um, um, you know, pretty close to how we exited uh, Q4 21. Uh, so strong bounce back. Workforce solution orders uh, were, were definitely flat quarter to quarter and down from what our expectations. Um, we, as we talked about on the last uh, on the earnings call that we had, uh, we are investing in uh, in sales initiatives um, to to drive that that business and get it back up to where where we like it to be. Uh, and revenue somewhat flat, a slight dip from uh, the twelve seven to the eleven point nine in Q three. Um, so some, some highlights on, on those financials, sort of. As I started talking about with performance orders, uh, the revenue itself uh, was uh, strong compared year over year, increasing over not 9%. Uh, and you can see um, you know, each of the quarters, the performance uh, engineering segment uh, has increased revenue. Um, improved gross margin for the overall company. That's also driven by you know, the performance engineering segment having higher margin business. So we're up to 27.4%. So we, we like the direction that, that that's headed. And uh, as we've talked about, software sales have increased, total software sales increased 147% uh, in Q3. Um, so the sequential increase compared to Q2. And then we still had a sizable backlog, uh, 32 million at the end of September. Uh, we have this uh, peer group analysis in here uh, with companies that are either, you know, um, you know, consulting space, engineering services firms, things of that nature. You know, even at, you know, at the 70 cent stock price, when you look at enterprise value, sales and so forth, it's um, GSC is at a, a, a discount to our peer group. Kyle, if you want to. Yeah, some... I'll take it from here and uh, take some Q&A. So our focus uh, as we've stated, is to capitalize on the demand, increasing demand at the existing facilities that need improvements and upgrades to continue to provide uh, new carbon-free baseload through nuclear power generation and expand that power uh, generation. 
we're focusing as a company on cross-selling and upselling. So really trying to get into the budget holder and C-suite of uh, the plants and the headquarters of our utilities so that they know who we are, the breadth of what we offer, and can engage more efficiently and more broadly with, with our customers. We're focusing and have invested quite a bit in strengthening our divisional leadership and investing in our sales force. We are, are delivering uh, on ex an exciting solutions pipeline. We have a great lineup of products that um, you know, we've created in conjunction with client feedback and across our engineering group. That's how new solutions like thermal system monitoring have been created and introduced to the market. And meanwhile, as Emma has highlighted, streamlining our operations, containing costs, and maximizing cash flow, uh, we're keeping our eye on the ball there. So in summary, look, we're a very specialized platform, uh, over 50 years of providing solutions and technology and engineering capability and white collar uh, staffing, we call above the shoulder staffing to the sector. Um, there are very significant favorable and long-term industry drivers that all you need to do is open up a newspaper now and it's uh, top of mind for the world and it's being backed by government support at long last. Uh, we have a solid growth strategy. We're focused on what we have and growing organically. We've demonstrated we've been there before the pandemic and focused on getting back to that level. A great leadership team, you know, very honored to have the team here. Uh, they really helped us focus to get through the pandemic and uh, be leaner and stronger uh, coming out of it. We have a great client base. Uh, they pay their bills. They have very significant long-term uh, needs and we've aligned ourselves to that. And look, as, as Emmett highlighted, we feel we have a very attractive valuation and as a company, um, a publicly held company, we're for sale every day and certainly um, open to strategic and transformative opportunities if they make sense for our shareholders. So please, you know, follow up, happy to follow up one-on-one. -on -one. Here's our contact information. I know Adam, I'll hand it back to you uh, for, I think you had some questions you wanted to put forth. Yes, thanks, Kyle and Emma, for the overview. So let's uh, expand a bit on a few topics, a few moments here. Um, how has your industry evolved over the past few years? W where are we in the cycle? It seems like we're on the brink of a new renaissance for the nuclear industry. Is, is that the case? And if so, why? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that at first, if that's okay, Emma. Yeah. Well, look, you, you know, the state of the industry has changed quite a bit uh, since Emma and I have been here for you know over six years now. Uh, we came in, uh, nuclear was uh, not really top of mind uh, at, at a national level. Um, industry, quite frankly, according to one senior executive at a very, very large operator five years ago, they were wondering if they were gonna start shutting down some of these marginal plants in a deregulated area. And through uh, broader recognition, uh, the value of carbon-free baseload generated by nuclear, uh, accelerated by um, national security concerns that the invasion of Ukraine really has put front and center. It's real and it's here today, not just in Western Europe, but in the United States and in Southeast Asia, East Asia. Um, uh, really, nuclear power is now being supported financially and from a regulatory standpoint to, the, to, to where these plants that six, seven years ago perhaps may have been planned to shut down are actually being invested in to sustain their lifetime and produce more power from those plants. As you know, the growing enlightenment for uh, a zero carbon economy, especially a zero carbon grid um, has really swept across the Western world. Um, you know, that's very exciting. So it's changed a lot. So are we on the, are we at the point of a nuclear renaissance? We haven't seen uh, this type of support for the nuclear power industry probably since the nuclear renaissance, but for very different reasons. And the industry has been very cautious coming out of the pandemic. So we're very optimistic about the future and very eager for spend to increase now that these very big national security, energy security, uh, zero carbon grid goals are now in place with economic support from the government. We're very eager for clients to start spending to get there. What are some of the key accomplishments you've achieved in the past year that you're proud of and, and are important to share with investors? Ed, do you want to take yeah, that? Yeah, I can start with Kyle. Uh, look, I think uh, one of the things that we're proud of is uh, our growth in the software piece of the business. Uh, we've been focused on that. 
and it's starting to we're starting to reap some of the benefits with uh, seeing that that growth, um, but not just in sort of the revenue line, the the product that we're offering, the enhancements that our R and D team has made, our customer feedback that's positive. So so we're, we're, you know we we deem that as a significant accomplishment, and I think our diversification of the business. Um, you know, as Kyle started out when we go through the history when we first started. Um, we were really singularly focused and the acquisitions helped us diversify and is enabling us and positioned us for the future now on the cross-selling efforts and the organic growth. So I think those are two, two highlights, particularly in the, in, the, in the last few years, the growth of software and that diversification of the business. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd only add to that during the pandemic really um, focused on, even despite the decreased client spend, uh, we spent a lot of effort engaging with customers to put commercial infrastructure in place so that as they come out of this downturn in their spend, uh, it's easier to pick GSC. They know us uh, and, and they know our full capabilities. We spent a lot of time getting in front of customers uh, through the pandemic and especially over this past year um, as things began to open up, at least from taking a meeting. Um, so so those, are, those are key elements of commercial infrastructure so to speak, that we put in place to make sure we're, we're poised for growth. Thank you, Kyle and Emif. We really appreciate your time today. If anyone out there has not already signed up for a one-on-one, -on -one, again, please send me an email at lowensteinerlithampartners.com or again, visit www.lithampartners.com forward slash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one re meeting request button. We hope you all enjoy the conference and, and thank you for joining. Thanks everybody, looking to speak to you.